In 1964, those lovable lads next door shook their shaggy hair and sang yeah, yeah, yeah. Or was that from the year before? Newsflash. On the weekend ending May 24th, 1964, the Beatles were still a thing. A big, serious thing. At number 10 this week, it's the Serendipity Singers with their bongo-propelled version of the nursery rhyme about the crooked man who walked a crooked mile. You might think this is the worst thing ever, and while it's no Mike and the Mechanics masterpiece, it has a certain goofy pleasure to it. Two weeks at a crooked number 10, and it was straight off the charts. Number 9 is the funnest record on this week's chart, the Bluebeat anthem My Boy Lollipop by Millie Small. Bluebeat was the export version of Scar, which played up the rhythmic bounce and played down the freneticism and all the knife fights. The record was recorded under the direction of Ernest Wranglin, one of the greatest of the all-time greats of JA Music, whom I had the pleasure of seeing in concert in 2011. At number 8, which one would logically assume was one whatever better than number 9, but isn't really. It's the bumpy and thumpy bits and pieces by the Dave Clark Five, which is devoid of tune, lyrics, a clever arrangement, but does have a lot of bump and thump. It sounds like the opening to a real song that's meant to generate excitement before the tune kicks in. Little did that matter as this hit number one back on the 19th of April. At seven sees the lush sounds of Vic Dana with Shangri-La. It actually has a tune that a James Bond film could have used, but Vic Dana ain't no Tom Jones, or Adele. On the other hand, he isn't Sam Smith either. It spent a humble nine weeks on the charts, sliding out on the week of the 5th of July. But I guess they had to make some room for chart listing of all of those Beatles records everybody was buying. At number six, it's the king, baby. With his jiggle-tastic Viva Las Vegas theme to his most successful and shortest film, it has the usual nonsensical plot, unlikely situations, flimsy motivation and disinterested acting, until Anne Margaret wiggles her way onto the screen and suddenly the movie has your attention. But enough of such trivialities. For the time being, the king was keeping his head above water in his battle for the charts with the mop popular ones, but every time they went head to head, the margins tipped a little more towards those woolly backs. Hi there. Small correction from the video that you were just watching. Um, I misspoke when I referred to the Beatles as woolly backs. They are in fact not woolly backs. A woolly back is something that someone from Liverpool would call someone from the more affluent areas in Cheshire or the gap between Liverpool and Manchester as opposed to someone who came from actual Liverpool or the Wirral. Now the Beatles weren't necessarily Scousers, there was probably one and a half Scousers in the Beatles, being Lennon and Harrison, but they certainly weren't Woollybacks. So I do apologise to any people from the city of Liverpool or anyone who still likes the Beatles out there. Time for Hello and Goodbye, the segment where we sweep out the old and bring in the shiny and new for this week's Top 10. Checking his hat and coat and peering through the smoke at the bandstand is Shangri-La, in its 7 up from 14. It replaces Hey Bob and Needle by Chubby Checker, an ill-advised venture into the folk twist subgenre. It's got some halfway decent points, Chubby gives it his all vocally and the drummer is a swinging cat for sure. But it just couldn't go with the high octane stuff the Beatles were dropping. It fell from 8 to 13. The next number one record was at number 15 this week and lo and behold it was not a Beatles disc. It was however an underrated and a little forgotten artist and it hogged top spot for four wonderful weeks. Here's something new. If you don't like it, do let me know. I'm going to go through the top 10, pick out the entries which in my opinion didn't really cut the mustard and then see if there's a song on the top 40 this week which never made the top 10 that is more deserving. So this is how it works. Shangri-La is a bit meh, but down at number 29, never to rise any higher, is Dusty Springfield's magnificent Stay A While, a much more deserving record of a top 10 spot. Similarly, Crooked Little Man is no great shakes either, whereas the great Delia Derbyshire leads the BBC Radiophonic Workshop on the Doctor Who theme, 
which never got higher than 33. So switcheroo and the top 10 gets a boost. What do you think of this idea? No more jive, it's time for five and it's our first encounter with the actual Beatles and their cheesy Big Macca, All My Lovin'. Their number one record, The Day I Was Born. This one had been hanging around like a way a lot of cobbled together Beatles singles did, yo-yoing up and down the 10. In fact, of all the number one hits we've surveyed thus far, only The High Women from 1961 and Ain't That Lovin' You Baby by Elvis Presley from later in 1964 have a lower ranking score assigned to it. Its score is 25.25. A record making number 10 for a single week would score 1.25 and something like I Wanna Hold Your Hand would score 138.25. But I guess that's just what people did. Bought whatever Beatles product was put in front of them in a crowded marketplace. The perfect proof of this was in the gap between Can't Buy Me and Love and A Hard Day's Night being issued. We contrived somehow to make Long Tall Sally number one for three weeks, while The Shadows, Billy Thorpe, Cilla Black and Louis Armstrong all failed to get there. But wait, there's more. At number four it was good old Judy Stone, still midway through crying at her 4,003,221 tears which makes Question Mark and the Mysterians seem positively lacking in lacrimosity. There used to be a hamburger shop up the road from my place. It's gone now. It's a pool supply store or some such. Anyway, displayed proudly on the wall was a photo of the proprietor and Judy Stone. She was a big star, not a glamorous one, not a headline maker, but a real star to the real people. This is a good pop record. The B-side is pretty nifty too that, along with Thorpey, was an Aussie flag in the sand against the British invasion. Three is Suspicion by Terry Stafford, a song most famous for an almost carbon copy version of Elvis Presley's, which is in fact, in my opinion, superior to Elvis's version. Stafford had one other hit in the US, I'm pretty sure he didn't bother the scorer in these parts again, and then settled into a career of modest hits on the country charts, the highlight being that he had a song picked up by the great George Strait. He died in 1954 in 1996 in Amarillo, Texas. This is a pretty cool record, and if you're going to be remembered for anything, that's a pretty good bar to have set. In at the big TWO is another one of those songs that maybe we should have considered finding a replacement for from the lower looms of the charts. The thoroughly wussified Lennon and McCartney number, World Without Love, as recorded by the thoroughly unnecessary Peter and Gordon. That said, they were better than Chad and Jeremy. Peter was Peter Asher, brother of Jane Asher, who was the paramour of Paul McCartney at the time, and he went on to cover himself in further artistic ignominy by ruining the career of one of the potentially greatest acts of the 1970s in Linda Ronstadt turning her into America's jukebox. Artistic ignominy perhaps, but doubtless her record company loved him. Anywho, they were amazingly successful here with 11 top 40s and two number ones and a classic song in I Go To Pieces that just needed someone better to do it. In fact, Linda Ronstadt would have crushed it. As a matter of fact, they only released three singles that didn't make the top 40. Looks like I'm eating humble pie for supper. World Without Love spent 10 weeks in the top 10 for a high watermark of number 2. It's time for Fowl's Fantastic World of Facts. Hooray! Biggest rise of this week is My Guy by Mary Wells, up 14 places from 29. The queen of Motown, she was unceremoniously cast aside when Diana Ross arrived on the scene. But she always knew a good song for her soulful voice and Smokey Robinson usually had something tasty for her to cut. Check out a song called Two Lovers. So cool. This was Wells' last solo hit at Motown. She exercised the option to terminate her contract when she turned 21, egged on by a sleazy boyfriend who convinced her that she could get better royalties and movie roles than other labels. She should have exercised the option to terminate her boyfriend. The biggest drop of this week was Good Golly Miss Molly by the Swinging Blue Jeans, which tumbled 10 to number 38 and the yawning moor of oblivion opened wide to receive them. 
Highest debutante was the Burt Bacharach Tacula, Walk On By by Dionne Warwick. Amazingly, this classy song only spent nine weeks on the charts and got no higher than number nine. Ah, this is why we can't have nice things. And the longest running chart record is The Beatles, whose She Loved You had, to date, put in a whopping eight months on the charts. I really believe She Loves You is, if not the best, and I'm not saying it isn't, record they ever made, but damn if it isn't the most important. From Crazy Blues to Blue Yodel Number 9 to Billy's Bounce to Walk on the Floor Over You to The Birth of the Cool to Heartbreak Hotel, this was a similar, game-changing, epoch-defining record. In the USA with LBJ, it was my guy on top for the last of its three weeks. It was the first number one hit Motown ever had. And across the pond in the UK, the home of the rubbish number one, one of the worst is on top this week, Juliet by the Four Pennies. The singer sounds like he's being held upside down by the ankles and shaken violently. It did make the top 40 here in Australia, spent two weeks in, got to number 35, but we realised what rubbish it was. This time last year, in the foreign country of the past, Number Onesville was populated by I Will Follow Him by Little Peggy March. A year into the undiscovered country from whose born no traveller returns, the future, the local number one will be Ticket to Ride by the very Beatles themselves. And there's no number one album for this edition. We didn't start recording records on recorded records until 1965. He ain't no pimp, he's a swingin' chimp. Come on, Monty, time to wreak some havoc. This week's number one is the record that marks the end of the first phase of the Beatles' career, Can't Buy Me Love. Up to this point, the songs had all been sexless, jolly, jointy, mop-top, pop-bops that existed on a continuously rising plateaus. I know that plateaus only rise once, so cut me some slack. Despite my love of She Loves You, I have to concede that I Want to Hold Your Hand surpasses it in every quantifiable way. The follow-up, Can't Buy Me Love, though, seems like a sidestep, or worse, a regression sponsored by McCartney's inherent musical sentimentality. Being a complete McCartney right, it was effectively the end of the McCartney and Lennon working together as songwriters as they had previously. It was the first single McCartney sang lead on, and it was the first record that they only had one voice on it. It swings like an elephant's vacuum cleaner. Ringo's drumming is spectacularly in the pocket, and Harrison actually plays his solo uninhibitedly. The B-side, you can't do that, is kind of duff and nasty, but it's a good kind of duff and nasty. Six weeks at number one, and this earned every one of them. And... Like sands through the hourglass, so are the days of the foreign country. I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments, and if the good Lord's willing and the creeks don't rise, I'll see you again with more implausible tales next week. Ish. <laughs>